Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for this amazing, awesome day. It's Pentecost, the day when we remember that you, Holy Spirit, came down upon us and you fill every believer. And it's for the salvation of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Spirit, you are not a thing. You are not a it. You are God yourself and dwelling in us, sanctifying us, and drawing us to our Heavenly Father. Be our teacher today. Bring encouragement, bring strength, bring conviction, bring comfort. You are the great comforter. And as we've sung, as you fall upon us, well, may we fall at your feet, King Jesus, to worship you. As we've commanded to be continually, always filled by you, Holy Spirit, teach us and show us how that we would truly long for your presence. Father, give me your words. I would say only what you want, nothing else. Glorify your name, Jesus, amongst us. And it's in your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen and amen. You all may be seated. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. How are you doing? Ilanka and worship team, thank you so much. I kind of gave it away in my sermon or my prayer but what is today? What are we celebrating today? Anybody got a guess? Pentecost. It's back in Acts chapter 2, which we saw about three months ago. For those who are visiting us today, we're going through the book of Acts. And if you've been paying attention, we kind of jumped several chapters here. We went from like chapter 21, 23. Today it's going to be chapter 28. Today is the last Sunday that we'll be focusing on the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 28, it's what Kate read in Spanish. Thank you very much. Gracias. Acts chapter 28, verses 23 through 31. But before that, I do want to read, and it should be on the screen. There's a passage in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'll read. This is what the author of Hebrews says. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses... Surrounding us, let us lay aside every, what does it say? Every hindrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance. One of the things that I love about the New Testament is Paul and some of the other authors, they talk a lot about athletics, sports, running. Now you might look at my body and think, ooh, I'm not a runner, but I love to run. Unfortunately, I have a permanent bad wheel because of basketball. I can't run anymore. And it hurts sometimes because I love to run. But when I read passages like this, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can, I can totally relate. If you go eat a Big Mac or a large pizza and then go out and decide to run six miles, you're going to be hindered. It's going to be painful. And the command here is to throw off, lay aside every what? hindrance. Last week we looked at the title of last week's sermon was The Church Endures. Today it's The Church Unhindered. And one of the last verses that we saw right here in Acts chapter 28 is that without hindrance Paul taught and preached about the kingdom and the Lord Jesus. Without hindrance. Do you guys know what it's like to be hindered? Why? What is it? What is it that hinders you? Is it relationships? Is it this nagging habitual sin? Is it heart attitudes you struggle with? Is it finances? Is it something physical? Is it your age? Is it your job? Is it your boss? Is it your kids? Is it your financial situation? We could think of a thousand and one things that hinders us. And it does pull us down. Paul, and we'll see it here in a minute, he had numerous excuses to be hindered. In these last few years that he was in prison here, before he was released. What does hindered mean? What does unhindered mean? I got two definitions. What does hindered mean? This is what hindered means. To cause delay, to interrupt, to hamper or impede, to prevent from doing, acting, or happening, to stop. That's what hindered means. What does unhindered mean? Well, it's the opposite. This is what unhindered means. Able or allowed to happen or continue without being slowed, stopped, or made more difficult. 
Now, I've got a picture of my dog. His name is Bo. He is about 80 pounds. He's a nine-year-old now. And if you pay real close attention, you'll see that he's on his leash. There are many times that we're starting to let Bo go outside in our yard and run around because he's becoming an old toot. He's nine. And one dog year is seven human years. So if you're good at math, nine times seven is what? Mm, Y'all must have got a bunch of D's or C minuses in math. It's 63. He's 63 years old. He doesn't quite have the get up and go that he used to have. But he still loves to get out. And we put him on that leash. I mean, he tugs at it. He pulls at it. He'll just sit up on our porch and just, he looks super depressed. And as soon as we let him off that leash, he's out of there. He is gone, gone, as Adam would say. He doesn't want to be hindered. None of us do. But right here in Acts chapter 28, and we're going to read through this several times, but here's the context. Paul has been in prison for more than two years. He went back to Jerusalem to deliver tons of offerings and tithes that the churches had collected for the poor church in Jerusalem. And he gave it to the leadership there, and he was there, and he was arrested. And he was thrown in prison, and he was in prison for over two years in Israel. He was tried twice by two governors, testified before the king of Israel. And Paul thought that he was never going to get out. And as a Roman citizen, Paul was Jewish, he was a Pharisee, and he was also a Roman citizen. He appealed to Caesar. And so they had to send them to Rome. While going to Rome on a boat, he was shipwrecked. He was stuck on a tiny little island for three months. And after months of travel, he finally gets to Rome and he's under house arrest. It says right here after in chapter 28, you'll see, and there's a whole text here. We're not going to look at all the verses, but Acts chapter 27 through 28 is this whole context of this story. After having been in Rome for three days, say three, three days, Paul calls for all the Jewish religious leaders, and they come to his house where he's under house arrest, and he explains to them all that happened, and you can read it in chapter 28, and these religious leaders, they're Jewish, and they're like, we've never heard of any issue with you in Israel, but we've heard about the way, which was the name of Christianity back then, and we want to know more about it. So they had a day, they decided, you know what, we'll meet back here at my house, Paul, and we'll talk all about the way. And that's where we pick up right here in verse 23. After arranging a day with him, many came to him at his lodging. Say many, many. And from dawn to dusk, have you ever been in a church service from dawn to dusk? Woo! I have from dusk to dawn. And when Holy Spirit shows up, Christy and I, before we were married, we were in college. And we would have a Sunday night worship service at our school. Every Sunday night where there was worship and a focus on missions. And one night they talked about revival and what true revival is. The service started at 7 p.m. Sunday night. Guess when it finished? 6 a.m. Monday morning. And we still weren't done. The Holy Spirit showed up in a powerful way. Students started confessing their sins publicly. What you saw in Asbury several months ago. By 6 a.m. the next morning, there were lines at two microphones at the front all the way to the back of the chapel. There were probably 900 students in that room. And they decided, we need to stop. We need to go to class. So we will meet Monday night at 9 p.m. That meeting went from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. And they decided we will do this until there's no more confession of sin. It was the most amazing week that I have ever experienced personally of seeing how Holy Spirit, when he brings healing and transformation and forgiveness. You see, Jesus said in John chapter 7, whoever is thirsty, say thirsty. Whoever is thirsty, come to me and I will give him living water. And it will flow out of him like a well of living water. And that living water is the Holy Spirit. So from dawn to dusk, Paul, and it says here that he expounded on the, and he testified about the kingdom of God and about the Lord Jesus. And it says he tried to persuade them from the law 
The book of law, the law of Moses, and the prophets. Now, what is the law of Moses? It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And from the book of the prophets, he tried to expound and persuade them that Jesus is the Messiah. He testified and he persuaded. Now, here's a key point. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings conviction. We can never, ever convince anyone to put their faith in Jesus. But we can't expound on who Jesus is. We can teach about who Jesus is, and we can testify who Jesus is. You know, this entire book, it's about one person. It's about the Lord Jesus. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah, and Jesus fulfills every one. Think about it. Over 300 prophecies, and Jesus fulfills every one. Every single book of the Old Testament, and there's 39 books in the Old Testament, they point to and talk about Jesus. Even on the day that Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3, when God confronts them both, and then he confronts Satan who had tempted them, God tells Satan that there will be enmity between him and the offspring, the descendants of Eve. And God himself says, you will bite his talon, his ankle, his heel, but he will crush your head. That's the first prophecy about the Messiah. Thousands of years later, Satan has Jesus crucified. It's through God's plan and sovereignty. But because of Jesus' death and his resurrection, he crushes Satan's head. And he breaks the power of sin and death. That is just one of 300 prophecies about Jesus. So Paul, who was a religious Pharisee before he came to know Jesus, he knows the entire Old Testament by memory. And all day long, he's talking to them. How do they respond? It says that some believed, some didn't. And then Paul rebukes them by quoting Isaiah chapter 9, or chapter 6, 9 through 10. You guys are always hearing, but you're never perceiving perceiving you're always seeing but you're not it says oh how god longs for the sinner to repent for the evil person to repent and turn from their ways to be saved and right here at the last verse it's the end of verse 27 where it says that they would understand with their heart and turn and i would heal them you see god's heart is for everyone to come to know jesus God's heart and his longing is for everyone to be saved. That is his heart. God longs to heal. And when Paul said that, many of them left. And they left arguing vigorously about everything that they heard. But then Paul rebukes them and he says, Look, because you, the Jews, have rejected Jesus, salvation has been given to the Gentiles. And they will hear if you're not Jewish raise your hand if you're not Jewish raise your hand you are a Gentile and God loves you so much that the Messiah Jesus who is Jewish he died not only for the Jewish nation but for you he loves you And then right here, and this is what I love here about this whole passage here. Paul was in prison. He was in prison for at least two years in Israel. And then here, he was in prison. It says house arrest for two whole years. If you read verse 30. Right here in verse 30, Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house. But he was under house arrest. He had a Roman soldier with him 24-7. He was given some freedom, but he truly was hindered. Kind of like my big dog, Bo, on a leash. He couldn't go where he wanted. He couldn't do what he wanted. Paul longed to get to Spain because there was no gospel presence in Spain. And when Paul wrote the book of Romans, he wrote to the Romans saying, I'm coming to visit you. And I'm coming to visit you to encourage you, but also for you guys to support me because there's no gospel presence in Spain at the time. And I need to get there because those who haven't heard need to hear. And he had a big interruption. 
he was put in jail for at least four years. A lot of us will look at Paul and we'll think, oh, he's a super Christian. But do you think Paul had dark moments and dark times while in prison? Absolutely. Do you think Paul doubted God's sovereignty and God's goodness? Absolutely. Do you think he struggled with depression and discouragement while in prison? Absolutely. And yet right here we see in verse 30, 31, Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house and he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all what? Boldness, not obnoxiousness, but boldness and without hindrance. There are many times when we will feel hindered. We'll come up with obstacles and challenges, rather physical, spiritual, emotional, financial, relational, where it feels like we might be getting boxed in, kind of like under house arrest. We have a boss, or we have a spouse, or we have children, or we have parents, and things are really hard. Physically, we might have a sickness or an ailment. We might be struggling through depression or discouragement. And it feels like we're being hindered and tied down like a dog on a leash and we're not free. And we get pressed down really hard and it feels like we're being hindered. We looked at a verse earlier where we're commanded to throw everything off that hinders. And the sin that so easily entangles. So part of that hindrance might just be our heart attitude of surrendering and confessing to the Lord our anger, our bitterness, our resentment, our hate, our greed, our selfishness, our idolatry, our desire to be free, but free to do what I want to do and only what I want to do and not what the Lord wants to do. I can imagine that Paul struggled with selfishness, pride, self-pity, while under house arrest. But at the same time, I can imagine, because Paul had been a believer for decades now, that Paul had learned how to trust in the Lord, wait on the Lord, look to the Lord, hope in the Lord, even when it seems like everything in his life is being closed in and dark. There is no recording after this passage of what happened to Paul. According to church tradition, he was released for a short time, actually went to Spain for a short time, planted churches, was rearrested, was put in a dungeon, and was then beheaded by the Emperor Nero. But while Paul was in prison, this prison... He wrote the book of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And there's a verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, at the very end, when he wrote this letter to the Philippian church, who he started with Timothy and Silas and Luke. He wrote the Philippian church because they cared deeply for him. And this is what Paul says, all the saints send you greetings, all the saints in Rome. They send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Pay attention to that. While Paul was in this house arrest, being watched by Roman soldiers, and because he appealed to Caesar, he stood before Caesar. He testified about who Jesus was before Caesar. And some of Caesar's household came to know Jesus. Things will happen to us that might not make sense. Challenges, physical challenges, economic challenges, difficulties. But there are three things very quickly that we can learn from Paul from this passage. The first one is always be ready. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have in Christ. The second thing that we can learn from Paul is this, is shine the light and love of Jesus. 
Jesus commands us in Matthew 5, 16, shine your light so before men and women so that they may see your good works and praise our Heavenly Father. The third thing that we can learn from Paul is hospitality. Romans chapter 12, verse 13 says this. This is what it says about hospitality. It's a commandment. Share with the saints their needs and pursue hospitality. Paul received everyone into his home, which was a prison. We're to pursue hospitality. And then Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2 says this about hospitality. Don't neglect to show it. Paul welcomed everyone all to his home. Always be ready. Shine your light. Show hospitality. It's impossible to do it without the power and presence of Holy Spirit. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians while in this prison. And at the end of that, his letter to the Ephesians, he talks a whole lot about the Holy Spirit. And he says, don't be drunk on wine, but be filled by the Spirit. We receive the Spirit by putting our faith in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will never leave us nor forsake us. It's God himself. But we can quench the Spirit's fire. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. It's God. The Spirit is not a thing. It's not an it. It's God himself. And by our own hard attitudes, our own sin, our own anger, our own selfishness, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't abandon us. But it's almost like a cup with a couple holes in it where he just kind of loses out. And we might not be aware of his presence. We might not be aware that he's speaking to us and he fills us. So as we close with this hymn that all of us, most of us are going to know about God's incredible faithfulness, there's a couple things I want to encourage you to do, to think about, to ponder on. Are you grieving the Holy Spirit in your life with unconfessed sin, with selfish, sinful, arrogant, angry, bitter heart attitudes? Or just simply by telling the Lord no when he's told you to do something? As we sing, I want to encourage you to, I can never remember the phrase in English, but it's to rendir cuentas, is to make accounts with the Lord and let Holy Spirit speak to you, let him fill you. I don't see it much anymore here because the way we live here in the United States, we can so hide behind the doors of our home. But in Mexico where we lived, every Sunday morning when I walked to church, I saw at least one or two men, almost every Sunday, passed out on the curb because they had been so filled with alcohol the night before. And I've seen men so controlled by alcohol, so drunk, that it controlled everything that they said, everything that they did. And it speaks to me powerfully when Paul says, don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the same evil way that alcohol can control someone in such a horrible, wretched way, on the flip side of that, we should be so filled with Holy Spirit that he should control our attitudes, our actions, our words. So as we sing, let's stand, let's sing. There'll be a couple of us over here to my left, your right, at the next steps. We would love to pray with you for anything if it's a physical sickness just discouragement if the Lord is speaking to you convicting you we would love to pray with you let us sing let us worship